Uh, I'm Grazian Krishan. Um, I work for National Instruments, and to give you some context, uh, National Instruments makes uh, hardware and software for the test measurement and control markets. Uh, I'm part of the real-time OS group at National Instruments. Uh, uh, we've been using preempt RP for the last six or seven years uh, on all new hardware. Uh, we still maintain some old legacy hardware, but I won't talk about that, and we're trying to get rid of that. <laughs> Um, uh, our main two architectures currently are uh, ARM and 64-bit Intel uh, CPUs, uh, and our main platform we support is this embedded CPU plus FPGA combo, uh, but we support many more than that, um, and we use Open Embedded to build our distro. I do have a couple of disclaimers. Um, this is work done by multiple people. I try to link at the bottom of slides uh, to their mailing list posts or commits or so, and so on. Um, I intentionally picked uh, some RT troubles that have ugly hacks in R3 currently, so don't throw too many stones or frozen sharks at me. Uh, <laughs> and some data might be still by now. Uh, the Linux kernel moves, moves very fast. I tried to get numbers off the latest branch, which was two weeks ago, and lots of things changed since. Um, uh, and this is kind of my agenda for the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm going to do one slide on the problem space and then go through uh, describing an RT trouble area we've run into. And since this RT summit is supposed to be about discussion, hopefully we'll have a good discussion around it. Uh, and I'm going to do this as long as I have topics and we have time. Uh, so the problem space for us, uh, it's defined in terms of uh, control loop rates. So there's, uh, there's two ways you can run a control loop. Uh, you can reserve a core and run it full tilt uh, in polling mode. Uh, that's possible with Linux. There's some usability issues with that, but uh, that's not the area I'm going to concentrate on. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on control loops that are uh, triggered by a timer expiration or, or some other event. And uh, in that space, uh, for us, the trouble space is uh, this area uh, of control loops that uh, need to run between 10 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz uh, frequency, uh, which roughly correspond to wake up latencies between 10 microseconds and 100 microseconds. Um, that's because uh, usually control algorithms are fairly simple uh, things. Uh, PID is just a couple of multiplications and additions. So the control loop, uh, iteration time, it's actually dominated by uh, wake-up latency. Uh, and I also listed, um, let me see if I can uh, get a pointer here. Uh, I, I listed kind of where our slowest uh, platform currently stands and our um, fastest, just to give you an idea. So with that, uh, I'm going to start with the first trouble area we've run into. And uh, it was discovered actually by just bumping into an Ethernet cable. I think Julia did that <laughs> while running a cyclic test run. Um, and then uh, more recently, we found it with uh, a TPM chip we were testing. This time, we were looking intentionally for it because we knew it could be a problem. So the symptoms are uh, the CPU appears stalled in the middle of a, a memory mapped I.O. read instruction. And the timer interrupt gets delivered late, even though interrupts are enabled. And um, it was discovered with the E1000, E1000E drivers, um, and uh, like I said recently, with the TPM uh, TIS driver. Um, and this is how it looks. There's a lot of, this is a screenshot of Kernel Shark. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, I just wanted to show you how it looks, uh, if you look in the upper right corner between those two cursors there, how it looks on a kernel shark uh, trace. Uh, you can see that long stretch of time where the CPU just does nothing. Um, and this is how it looks if you plot a cyclic test histogram while uh, running that TPM, uh, while accessing that TPM uh, chip in parallel from a scared data thread. Uh, low priority thread, you get this uh, weird histogram with a really long and flat tail that's over 400 microseconds in length, um, and, and that's the added latency uh, uh, caused by the accessing that TPM chip. And by comparison on this graph, I, I overlaid a hackback drawn that uh, maxes out at 56 microseconds on this platform. Um, 
Why this happens is uh, essentially because the CPU can write exponentially faster than the I.O. device can sync. So the writes get buffered between the CPU and the I.O. Um, this is ge generally not an issue if the number of writes is small. Uh, uh, you usually don't notice it. Uh, but it, uh, if there's, you get a stretch of writes in a row, uh, like with that uh, Ethernet uh, uh, driver, uh, when you uh, plug and plug the cable, there's a lot of reconfiguration of the Mac that needs to happen. There's a lot of writes that happen in a row. And then uh, you get this M a stall in the middle of the MIO read instruction, because that read instruction for the same memory region needs to be ordered with respect to the writes. And then um, it results in uh, hundreds of microseconds latency spikes. Um, and it's pretty obvious why that happens if you look at, uh, this is a fairly simple uh, CPU, uh, just a four core embedded uh, Intel CPU. And uh, if you look at the path the data has to take, for example, from that core all the way to this TPM chip that's connected to a fast SPI bus, it has to go through all this uh, I.O. fabric that's running at different frequencies and different bus widths. So there's all these buffers and arbitration that needs to happen along the way until you get to that TPM chip. Um, so we have a couple of hacks. They're really ugly currently. Um, for the Ethernet uh, driver, we just added a delay um, after, after like stretches like this where there's a a large amount of uh, register writes. Um, for the TPM chip, uh, one of my colleagues, Harris uh, Kanovich, uh, did a bit more involved patch uh, that essentially replaces the IO write uh, call uh, with an inline function that eventually, for preempt RT, uh, does a read after each write and uh, forces the flash of that write. So the effect is that you only get a singing access delay in the, in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the description of the trouble area. So uh, I'm hoping now we can, we can talk a bit about what, what we can do. I will preface this by saying we know this is a hardware problem. Unfortunately, it's a fairly, it seems to be a fairly common one. So uh, I'll be interested from the RT community if there's uh, other ideas what could be done. And uh, so I, I have a couple of prompting questions here. I don't know if you've encountered this in other drivers. Have you encountered it on other architectures? In principle, it's the same problem on all architectures. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. On all architectures which allow uh, posted rights. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> is the, how many rights queue up? Uh, I think it's a function of the buffers along the way. It's not fixed for the Ethernet. It depends also on the PCIe bus topology, how many switches are on the way. But the, like the 400 microseconds you saw on TPM. Uh, for the, I don't have data for the TPM. I know for the Ethernet case, it was about 40 writes in a row followed by a read. When it's a single write, it's not, it's not noticeable, essentially. You, can't, you almost can't observe it anymore. Yeah. So it must be a significant number of writes. Yeah, I would say, of, yeah, probably over 32 or something like that, yeah. We also did a test where we had a, um, an access pattern that just did arbitrary length register writes in the developer just to see like, how bad could we possibly, um, what state could we have to see. And we can basically draw that tail out um, do you know if there's any way to track these buffer states? I don't know if there's Intel people here, if there are any PMU counters or anything like that that we could use to track the buffer states. There might be something in the uncores. Yeah, but the uncores stuff only measures what's actually in the uncore. Well, the only thing you can you can see in the core PMU counters is the fact that you're stored. <laughs>
So, so the only thing you can see in the uh, core PMU counters is the fact that you're actually stalled and how long you stalled. But right. that doesn't tell you anything about yeah. why. Yeah, it doesn't help you try to prevent it by issuing a RAID or something, no. yeah. Um, so so did, you, did you look at the, <coughs> at the code in general if, that's a, uh, uh, if there's a lot of these patterns lurking around? Hmm. Um, that's kind of the first question here. It's like, and that's kind of the first question here is, is what tools are available to actually pick out those pieces that aren't just like grep around the source tree and figure out what the access patterns will be. Because some of these access patterns are going to be not obvious at all. Right. The, the problem is uh, it's, it's the writes at runtime. So it's not necessarily that if they're after each other in code, it's, um, it's the run, runtime path. Right. I mean, the, the question is whether we just hack some of the accessor uh, functions or inlines or whatever and uh, either instrument it in the first place to see how that amounts mm -hmm. or uh, you have to come up with some smart uh, non-intrusive instrumentation for that uh, but uh, the other thing is we might actually what we might do for RT is force the read back which is a performance problem. Mm -hmm. will, we then, will we then find hardware that breaks because the writes don't land fast enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, hardware is broken, we know that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I actually added that question, right. if, uh, if we could add a, a load to the IO rights. But it, there's going to have to be exceptions, because some loads have side effects um, for some things. Um, I think Julia posted that to the list. Uh, there wasn't any uh, follow-up uh, after that. Um, Maybe one good thing you could do is uh, document it in the wiki, that this is a problem. And if people look at that, that Basically, test your drivers yeah, and hardware. Look at it and, and figure out can you can you find any of those patterns in your driver? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we integrate some lightweight uh, instrumentation, which means um, just counting um, consecutive writes before a read hits. Mm -hmm. That should be fairly trivial if we do it per CPU, because it's unlikely to happen. Uh, uh, yeah, you can get scheduled over to a different CPU, but by then the problem is gone. Yeah, the, the problem is there. They, you also have to account for time, because it's OK if there's enough time between those rides. Right. Um, so maybe account, yeah. I mean, at least it will give you a rough idea, but it won't be very accurate, yeah. Um. <coughs> All right. Uh, for out of ideas for this, I'm going to move to the next topic, um, which actually is not a trouble anymore because uh, unfortunately I took a vacation, uh, two weeks of vacation right before the RT summit, and Sebastian submitted a patch the day before I left on vacation and fixed this issue. Uh, but I didn't have time to uh, change the presentation, so I'm going to talk about <laughs> it anyway because <laughs> uh, people might not be on the latest RT development tree. Uh, so the problem with this one, the symptoms for this one are if you have multiple time slits or timeouts um, coming from scattered threads, they can stack up to fairly large latencies. Um, and it's not just clock nanoslips you need to track. There's other things that use high resolution timers like uh, uh, locks that have timeouts, few taxis with timeouts. And, and in fact, that's how we first found it is uh, the, there were a bunch of, uh, uh, I think it was conditional variables with timeouts that stacked up uh, to a fairly um, large uh, latency. Uh, so this is an old trace uh, from back then, uh, and this is a bit more complicated because first you get the high uh, priority thread wake up, but then immediately there's another timer interrupt that gets stacked up. Then uh, there's the scheduler tick processing that takes about 40 microseconds uh, in, um, with interrupts disabled. Um, 
Uh, this is with uh, event tracing and an arm uh, running. At, uh, it's a fairly low power arm. And then you see, what you see in traces is this 15 microsecond sections uh, where HR-TARMA expirations get processed and uh, they, they keep stacking up to, they can stack, stack up to large latency. So when we first saw it, then we went and wrote a pathological test to see if we can reproduce it. And uh, uh, this just launches a configurable number of scattered threads and it does random nano slips up to one millisecond. And uh, using this uh, pre dump test, you can, you can reproduce the same pattern uh, where you, get, you see the cyclic test wake up. In this case, the uh, cyclic test, we were running cyclic test in parallel with this stress test. And, and then you see these 15 microseconds sections uh, of uh, HR timer expiration processing. Um, and uh, if you're curious how it looks on, on a histogram, I compared it with the hackbench run. So the hackbench runs are these green and um, uh, blue uh, traces up here, and they max out at like 59 microseconds on this Intel Atom running at 1.3 gigahertz. And by comparison, running cycle test in parallel with that stress test, uh, you get almost double the max latency, and you also get this like ugly looking histogram, uh, ugly for RT looking histogram. Um, and it's the same story on ARM. Uh, it's, it's a universal problem. Uh, and, and there, the max latency was even worse. Uh, so before uh, Anna Maria did a rewrite of the soft IRQ uh, for, for HI timers and uh, Sebastian submitted a patch, we had a fairly ugly hack that we tried. Uh, we didn't really ship because we weren't sure if it's safe, but what we were doing is marking as IRQ safe only the RT uh, tasks. Um, and like I said, right before I left for, for my vacation, uh, Sebastian submitted this patch that actually uh, fixes the issue for us. Uh, by comparison, this is the new histogram um, here with the patch, and uh, you can see that the uh, histogram looks nice and uh, spiky and uh, has a much uh, lower la max latency, and it's the same for ARM. Now, because this is a solved problem, I don't, really, I don't have a discussion, so I'm just going to do lesson learned, mainly. <laughs> mainly, don't live on vacation before your artist summit presentation. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go there, ahead. There is one thing that might need to be discussed, and that is the use of HR timers in general in the, in the kernel, because there is a, quite a large number of um, yeah, more or less misconfigured use slip ranges and things like that that need to be fixed, and there does not seem to be awareness that these things can cause problems. I wonder how much of these um, quite useless um, high-resolution timers are actually part of the problem here. Um, Which ones are useless? Well, having some like use slip ranges with min-max e being e equal, or use slip ranges that are in, in a range of 100,000 to 200,000, where it just doesn't make sense to use high resolution timer because you're not in the right context anyway. No, the, the problem is, um, so the timer wheel, at least as it is now after the rework of the timer wheel because it had, had its, uh, its own uh, problems, you can't use it for anything which should expire halfway precise. And it doesn't matter whether you're your expiry time is uh, 100 microseconds out or uh, five seconds out. So if you want to have halfway precise expiry times, and uh, basically what we decided in the kernel community is to give the user space interfaces, and that's what uh, a lot of things rely on today, like um, uh, poll uh, timeouts and, um, and other things. Um, you want to have a halfway precise uh, expiry time. The timer wheel degrades in, in precision uh, the further out you go. Because the, the reasoning behind that is uh, once we had high resolution timers as the timers, we basically have left the timer wheel as timeouts. 
And timeout means it catches something which shouldn't happen anyway. So if you look at the, at the statistics, um, how time of wheel timers, how often they expire. So if you do a heavy networking loads, um, except for a few things, uh, most of the time, 99% of the, of the time of wheel timers are canceled before expiry or reprogrammed before expiry. TCP timeout timers and stuff like that. So uh, what we decided to do in the timer wheel is basically only keep the first, um, the first wheel precise on the tick and then the, f the next wheels uh, degrade precision. So that has two effects. Uh, one, we can get rid of cascading which was a major pain in the neck uh, with the timer wheel, because if you had uh, hundreds of thousands of, of TCP connections on the machine, you, you had eventually to recascade a gazillion of, of timers into the next, into the next uh, wheel, uh, into the more precise wheel, in order to cancel them before expiry. So it, this was work done just for nothing. So, now, if you have something which you want to happen in exactly five seconds from now, the time of wheel is the wrong thing because it will either expire you in five seconds from now or in five seconds plus 12% or something like that, in the worst case. Yeah, but um, the, if I have a use slip range and I'm putting min equals max, um, it prevents optimization. And if I have a use slip range with a min of 100,000, a max of 200,000, um, and if you look at the context where that's used, it's very hard to see why that would need to be a precise timer in most cases. And there are just a lot of timers that were converted when use slip ranges was introduced, where I think there was not that much thought given to if that needs to be a high resolution timer or not. Yeah. So, it's just a matter of keeping the kernel clean with respect to high resolution timers. Yeah, I mean, I mean if, there, if there are uh, things we, where we could replace them easily uh, without uh, changing the functionality with timer wheel timers, then it, there's no reason why not. I mean, the range thing is basically, was, has been introduced um, uh, for power saving. And now that we have the, the, the uh, implicit batching on the timer wheel, uh, which gets into uh, less granular uh, ranges, the further out your timeout is, we might get away with uh, uh, converting some of those uh, HR timer users to, to, to the timer wheel as well. So without violating the, the power constraints. So, but you cannot do a wholesale conversion. You have to look at it uh, on a case-per-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. So we can put that on the ever-growing to-do list. Yes. <laughs> volunteers, volunteers. <laughs> yeah, but, but the Kochi script will just identify the place, but it doesn't can't make a decision. Yeah. That's the problem. You have to look at the at the, at the thing and in order to make a decision. That's not what a script can do. Mm -hmm. How much right. I love Kochi, but. <laughs> um, so report problems early, they might just get fixed for you. <laughs> There's these guys, great guys working on it. Um, all right. Um, RT trouble number three, it's actually not a kernel issue, it's a glibc issue, and that's the lack of priority inheritance support uh, for the locks in the Pthread library. Um, I, a couple months ago, so I, I did a survey looking on the slow path of the locking primitives in the Pthread library and what uh, few text operations they use. And uh, at the time, and hopefully it hasn't changed since, I don't think the code moves that fast in glibc, 
the only uh, locking primitive I could find that actually supported priority inheritance was uh, the mutex, uh, if you enable it through its attributes. Um, all the other ones, they either have an internal lock, uh, so the reader writer lock has an internal lock that uses uh, non-PI uh, uh, futex wake, uh, weight wake. Uh, semaphores, same thing. Uh, Peter spin is not that RT friendly, it just does user space spinning. And the conditional variables have a really long history, uh, and I was hoping Darren is, will attend, but he's not in the audience. <laughs> um, he filed the bug report in 2010, and as you can see, it's still open, um, that uh, basically Petri conditional variables don't support priority inheritance. And there's been a patch set or, uh, that's, uh, that Darren wrote, and uh, I believe Dinkar, um, I'm not gonna say his last name because I'm gonna mangle it. Um, and I helped port forward that patch a couple of times. Uh, it never got accepted. And uh, following the RT Summit last year, um, Torvald, Torvald Regal had a presentation around this uh, because um, conditional variables had to be rewrite uh, rewritten uh, due to uh, uh, C++ 11 uh, standard change. Um, and the last comment on this bug report uh, says essentially there's no known priority inheritance uh, way to achieve priority inheritance support on this. Um, personal gripe of mine, the POSIX standard actually hasn't changed yet. Uh, the issue is still open with the Austin group. Uh, uh, they need to clarify the, uh, essentially the ordering. Uh, if, if a signal can wake up a waiter that started waiting after the signal was sent, and, and that clarification hasn't been made yet in the POSIX standard. But the glibc code is changed now, so uh, p -track conditional variables don't have priority inheritance support. And the new implementation also has a priority inversion issue. As I understand it from the presentation last year, there's it's implemented with two groups, uh, one of active waiters and one uh, like uh, standby, and, and waiters won't get signal until uh, the active group, group gets completely signaled, and that can create priority inversions for RT threads that, um, that get put into the second group uh, and have to wait for a long time. Will you be here on Monday? Uh, yes. Darren will be here on Monday. Okay. Uh, so for a discussion, I was, I was going to ask if uh, you know of work in progress. <laughs> so apparently <laughs> there might be some, um, or, or any other changes since last year. Or, or if you know of a library for, for RT locking or RT data structures um, that do have priority inheritance support. I mean, the only known to be working PI implementation is, the, is, is, is P-thread mutex. The mutex. Mm -hmm. So I'm not aware of any other things out there. And I mean, you don't want to use uh, user space spin locks anyway. Right. Neither, neither on RT nor, nor on any other thing. I mean, there are use cases where you can do that, but you have to be very, very careful and, uh, in system design mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to make them work. I mean, even in the kernel, we fudged it. The dark you can't, I mean, multi-reader boosting, yeah. multi-reader boosting is, is dodgy. I mean, Steve done it, <laughs> but timing analysis, I'm not sure if that's ever been done on it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the old Solaris kernel um, used to boost the first reader and then just give up. But <laughs> <laughs> because as it turned out, there were very many cases that only had the one reader. So it, it right. more or less worked this ish, but, but yeah. <laughs> There's another question. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask for a clarification. If I have in the uh, hard real-time thread a broadcast mm. of the conditional variable, and in non-critical threads the uh, wait for it, conveyed, then if there is no changing of the mutex in this, if I do not lock the mutex in the waiting threads, mm -hmm or in the broadcasting thread, uh, then actual broadcasting is not blocking, or it is blocking. Uh, uh, 
Do you understand what yeah. I what Yeah, I the, mean? the problem is not with the external mutex associated, it, it's with the internal implementation of yeah. the... It's the internal implementation which has its own mutex which is non-PI. And you have to take that one in order to do broadcast. So even the broadcast Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the internal GLIPC implementation has a lock inside. Because in many cases, it would be interesting to have only the um, primitive, which allows to wake up uh, low priority threats, mm -hmm. which is really non-blocking. So basically using a bare footex, which should allow this, without the consistency of data and anything else, but only as a firing event to the, to the other low priority task. So what is the su suggested uh, primitive to use in this case? Bare few takes or? Yeah, I mean, it, either, I guess, rough few takes or, or a mutex. Um, yeah, the problem is the, the conditional variables, internals are really complicated and they need a lock to sure. mess around with their internal data structures. So. Um. All right. Uh, so the topic number four I had here uh, is uh, around managing uh, interrupt uh, threat priorities and um, priority inversions that are possible with that. Um, I'm going to start with a, another big disclaimer. Uh, this is work we did a couple years ago. We didn't know better. So the first two patches I'm going to ask your opinion on are, uh, I'm ashamed to show them. We didn't send them upstream for that reason. Uh, but uh, it's, it's still a good discussion to have. Uh, we're looking for best practice ideas here. Uh, so the first one comes from, the need for it comes from the fact that it's hard to associate an interrupt with its corresponding thread PID. So there's already a file in PROC uh, IRQ that lets you set the CPU affinity for an interrupt, and what we did was add another file that lets you set uh, its priority. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you know of uh, better ways to do this. Or if, or if well, what, sh what should we do about this patch, I guess? <laughs> obviously that won't work for deadlines. Yes, it won't work. I mean, what we could do is expose the, the, um, the threat ID in the PROC interface. Yeah, that'll work. So and it's a pure action thread ID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that will solve our use case. Would it be yelling murder? No. Just the security people, probably. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Supporting the thread ID would work. I would love to have work queues have a donor task like that, but instead they, they created an alternative universe for setting their mm -hmm. thingies. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah, that, that will work for us, so if that's acceptable. Um, the second uh, kind of patch question I had relates to uh, in interrupt threads that get created after boot. Um, for example, some Ethernet drivers don't uh, create their uh, interrupt threads until you plug in the cable. Um, so we have this uh, internal patch that allows you to pull on proc interrupts, and what that enables is uh, you can use, uh, I think Red Hat has a daemon called um, RTCTLD or something like that. Uh, that can uh, watch for things and uh, can associate a, a priority to uh, to a thread, interrupt thread. Um, is this the same thing to do, uh, enabling poll on proc interrupts? Are there other ways to do this? It sounds like it should be something you should do. Yeah, Dev? What's that interface we have for pulling files? Um, the one with zero mouse? I don't think they work for pseudo files. I don't know, but that is what you usually use to monitor for change. 
but it sounds like something for a Sisyphus. I mean, I have Sisyphus, I can do, you know, let's change this fast, I can plug in a wire or something like that, but a hardware change is usually Sisyphus, isn't it? I can speak louder. Yeah. <laughs> Sisyphus, okay. Um, all right, and with that, we are getting to them. The only hassle is we have no IRQ information in Sisyphus, as far as I know. So you would have to add all that IRQ stuff to Sisyphus as well. Hmm. Don't know. <laughs> And now for the more interesting problem of the priority inversions. Uh, so this is an example we encountered. Uh, we have some watchdog functionality that's implemented in a CPLD chip that's uh, connected to an I2C bus. Um, it can, for some complex cases, it can be configured to do more than just reset. Um, uh, it can fire and interrupt. Uh, the reason for that is to do things like save the I.O. and stuff like that. Um, so what happens is the high priority, uh, the watchdog interrupt is config, uh, thread is configured as high priority, it fires, all it's fine, until it tries to acknowledge the interrupt, and it needs to do uh, I2C transfer, so usually it needs to read the status register and write it back to conf uh, write back some register to uh, acknowledge the interrupt and uh, that I2C interrupt is lower priority and some mid-priority uh, interrupt thread or some other thread can uh, create a priority inversion. Um, Very simple solution to this. Don't use I2C for a thing which is important. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I2C is one of the slow ones. Uh, SPI is not much better, uh, SPI. Uh, so uh, I, was, uh, I was curious if there's any ongoing work uh, around uh, preventing priority inversions here, or more, in, in, more generally, uh, a solution to the priority inversion problem with completion objects. I squared C bus per priority. Very cheap, right? <laughs> with uh, completion objects. Mm -hmm. So one, one interesting uh, thing what's happening uh, right now is um, at least on the instrumentation side, um, and that might be something that we might uh, be able to hook into, is um, we got locked up support for cross-release that means that covers completions because you can create data locks with completions as well. But the locktap doesn't know about that today. No, now it knows. Mm -hmm. It does now. And people are complaining because, uh, of course, uh, it triggers false positives. But we've been there with the locktap as well and teach locktap that false positives mm -hmm. exist. Um, but in G it might be something we we might want to look into, into at least in, for instrumentation purposes. Mm -hmm. So to, to make it easier to, to decode uh, scenarios where you can end up with something which waits for a completion and then uh, you can see, oh, who is the, the other guy who is going to complete? Is that going to create a priority inversion problem mm -hmm. over time? It might, it might not. I mean, if you're waiting for this guy or you in your high priority threat, you're, it's your problem anyway. You can't do anything about that. But right. There are other things where you wait on completions. Mm -hmm. So, a slightly related problem is um, CPU frequency for I.O. weight. So, you, you'd like to boost the frequency um, when you're stuck on I.O. weight to more quickly submit new requests and all that stuff. Um, mm. But then I think during plumbers this year, um, the, the, the typical um, pipeline workloads, the, the, the DAC uh, workloads, they um, have a similar problem that 
every new thread waits on the work of the other one and, and how to um, do PI across that or, or the completion stuff across that. So that is something that people are, are exploring and looking at, but there's no real solutions yet. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all I had for troubles uh, since it's, uh, I have 10 more minutes, I'll go a bit into excess stuff. Um, just, uh, just some tips I had at the end of my presentation. Check your kernel configs after a kernel upgrade. We hit this uh, problem with on ARM. Uh, for security reasons, this option, this? this option got added, defaulted to yes. Increases, I guess, security. Not sure what it does, but basically what it does, it adds code in uh, all UXs, macros, safe registers, low registers. And as you can imagine, it, it creates a huge problem. You, you see this orange trace. It's, so what I plotted here is like how long uh, cloud get time takes. Uh, the blue trace is before the change. The orange trace is after. You can see the whole thing shifted. And um, it's a 10% hit if you look in perf for just doing clock get time. Um, so we disable that option and we live with a risk of, I guess, security. <laughs> what it does, it's, um, it's related to CPU domains. Honestly, I'm not sure. I know it's implemented in hardware in ARM V8, but it's all the ARMs before hard. that. Sounds like a smack, but if they're doing it in software, yeah, that'll, that'll hurt. Yeah. So, something to keep an eye on if you're running on ARM, ARM chips that are V7 or lower. Um, check your clock sources on new hardware, kernel upgrades. We've hit multiple issues. Uh, for example, on one piece of hardware, the TSC clock got disabled because the only other clock source was the ACP IPM, and I believe it's only 16-bit, and it rolled over, and it thought that the TSC is bad, and it disabled it. Um, so make sure you check um, that you're using the correct clock source. Pretty much, TSC is the only one that's RT-friendly. <laughs> uh, we also had an interesting boot hang caused by some test code that got left in the BIOS that left the TSC adjust register set on BIOS? first core. <laughs> this was your BIOS team doing that? Yeah. <laughs> you have educated these people, please? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they fixed it. <laughs> uh, luckily, we have a BIOS team that's in-house. Other people are not that lucky. <laughs> but yeah, I heard about this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Make sure you're using the correct clock source. Uh, compare timer expiration against external reference. Uh, a lot of times I found it useful to use it like just as plain oscilloscope and like uh, if, if you have a fast GPI or something, make sure that they're expiring at the time they're saying they're expiring. I also found it useful to drive the F trace, uh, trace from uh, a clock source that I trust. Um, and that way you can, because a lot of times after an upgrade, we're not sure if the trace has changed and it looks slower or if things are actually slower. So it helps to have an external reference for your clock source. And, sorry. Yeah, so it, it looked like things are taking longer in the trace, but we weren't sure if it's like uh, the tracing code change or. or right. Uh, trace points. Uh, there's a uh, trace benchmark uh, option that turns on a benchmark, so it shows the speed of the uh, trace points. Okay. So if you want to upgrade and you're curious if anything changed with the uh, trace points, uh, look at the uh, it's uh, one of the options in the debug configs. Uh, do that, that at least will tell you if uh, tracing slowed down or not. Awesome. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, and tip number three, run reboot tests. It's, it's incredible how many issues we've discovered by just running, calling reboot at the end of like, once your software stack is up, just call reboot, and it hit multiple issues. The most recent one was a, 
an Upson uh, shutdown that actually Peter fixed in uh, like record time. Uh, there was a race between exit and uh, Futex unlock, I think. Um, we hit X4 data corruptions, NAND read disturbs. This is an interesting one. We had a, a boot partition that was fairly small, so we didn't have a lot of free blocks. So if you read it often enough, it, you eventually uh, hit a read disturb and your system stops booting. Uh, all kinds of things. So running reboot tests is very helpful. Simple test is useful. We also do hard reboots. Uh, we expect data loss, but data corruption is not okay. Um, and our hardware team also runs it in a temperature control <coughs> chamber, which uh, brings out other gremlins. Um, so that's the end of the material I had. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>